Thank you for joining us for the Shine 180 podcast, stories of listeners' lives transformed by Jesus. I'm Steph Reynolds, Director of Partner Care here at Shine.fm. I have in the studio today, Ty Harris, veteran of the United States Air Force and now guidance counselor to the future generation. Ty was raised in a Christian home and has a solid foundation, but he didn't give his life back to Jesus until he was on the battlefield in a life and death situation. Listen as Ty authentically shares his faith journey and what keeps him strong in this battlefield of life. My name is Ty Harris, and I am the guidance counselor at Grace Christian Academy. Uh, So Ty, you are a valuable part of my kid's life. You are the guidance counselor there. And so I've seen you pour into kids' lives. And I have a feeling that's because you had people pouring into your life and that you are invested into the future generation. So we want to get into all of that. But before we start, tell us something that no one like no one would expect to know about you. Wow. (laughs) What a question, right? (laughs) That's a tough question. Um, I think a lot of times when people see, you know, a big guy like me, you know, they 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 don't they don't they they think that it's more of a you know hey he's a tough guy he's a big guy he's a strong guy, well you know deep down I just want what's best for my students, um, I want them to be successful I want them to be producers for the kingdom of God Amen. and more than anything I want them to open themselves up to listen to direction from God. Amen. So let's start out with your childhood. Back up how many years ago? And uh, I know, obviously, a lot of your family and your mom and have such great respect for her. Um, but tell tell us about your childhood a little bit. Oh, uh, well, I grew up in a military family. Both of my parents were in the Army, and we moved around a lot until I was about 14 years old, 13, 14 years old. And we ended up living in Joliet. And uh, that's where I attended uh, Ridgewood Baptist Academy and... Um, started high school there. So when um, was the time where you asked Jesus into your life and knew that he was going to be the savior of your life? I would say probably back when I was about eight years old, we were going to, believe it or not, Woodridge Christian Academy Mm -hmm. at the time. And uh, my Sunday school teacher, Miss Salapek, she was very, she was a very kind woman and she spent a lot of time with us in Sunday school. There's only five or six of us. So she got to be very, very individualized with us. And, and, and I voiced some concerns when I was eight or nine years old. I was like, listen, I know from what I've heard in church, this is what I'm supposed to do. And I feel like that it's time, you know, it's time for me to accept Christ into my heart and start living that life. And she helped me through the process. And I was baptized maybe three months later at uh, Woodridge Baptist Church. Yeah. So I know your mom ended up being a single mom and such a strong lady she is. But um, tell me about your teen years and how what those look like. Well, you know, it was tough. It was tough. My dad, my dad kind of, I don't know, he left when we were about five. So, you know, there was a lot of years where there was struggle. And my mom made sure that right around when I was six or seven that we started going to church. We started going to Windsor Springs Baptist Church in Augusta, Georgia. And, you know, we found a family there. And that's how early on I knew that this was someplace I was supposed to be. The people were so kind. They did I can't even explain to you how much they did for us when we were kids. And, you know, from then on, you know, we we were in church, in church, in church. Church was pretty much our lives. And then teenage years, when I went to Ridgewood, same thing, you know, church three times a week, youth group. um, You know, we did pretty well there at that school, you know, basketball and stuff like that. I had a pretty good high school career. So did you feel like uh, your relationship with Jesus sunk in at that point during those teen years, or did you feel like you were going through the motions? I'm, I'm going to be honest with you. It was one of those things to where it did get a little robotic for me. You know, being in church every day from being five, it was, oh, it's Wednesday night church, you go. Oh, Sunday, Sunday night, you go. And this, that, and the other. And it did. It did. And I would say that probably lasted all the way through, midway through my military career, is I got, I got stagnant. I really did. So after high school, then you did you enter the military right away? Yeah, I think maybe nine months after I graduated, I was on delayed enlistment program, and that's only because I couldn't get in any faster, and I was I was trying. But yeah, about nine months after I graduated. And what branch? Air Force. Okay. And then how many years did you serve in that? Total, between recall and everything, I think seven and a half years. And what was your heart in getting into the service? I... 
you know, both my parents were in the military and, you know, growing up around bases and stuff, I, I just couldn't tell else I wanted to be. You know, I wanted the uniform, I wanted to help people, and I wanted to be, I wanted to be a firefighter really bad. And they had a lot of openings at the time for firemen, and I was like, this works out perfect. You know, I get to be a fireman, get fully trained, my college is paid for, there's no downside to this. Wow. So is that what you ended up doing? Mm -hmm. You yep. were a fireman in the service through the Air Force? Yep. Okay. And you served the seven and a half years. Mm -hmm. And then what were those years like? Wow. I I learned a lot my first year. I learned, I think I learned three major things. Number one, it was definitely not cool to be a Christian. It was not cool at all. Number two, people will, I don't know, I would say there was there, there, uh, there's a large amount of persecution for anybody that wants to be any kind of different. And I would say number three, and this was the biggest of all, is that even people that I went to church with in the military didn't really understand why they were going to church. They just went. So what did that do to your faith at that time? It was a struggle. I struggled real hard for about, I would say my whole military career, I struggled really hard because it was, there was all this stuff going on every weekend. Your friends are like, hey, let's go do this. Let's go do that. None of it was really aligned with my belief system and none of it was probably productive or good for me either but i was like hey 99 percent of people are doing it so i'm going to do it too and I, I strayed away probably about as far as you could go so then after the military after those seven and a half years you got out and then what happened then after that it was kind of like you know bouncing around from job to job i floundered quite a bit because i never thought i wouldn't be in the military so it was just a struggle. And then luckily enough for me, I, I found school. You know, I was like, you know what, let me try college. And I think school was one of the things that helped me find some sort of focus. So that's probably why now you are even wanting to speak into teens' lives about going to school and being a guidance counselor. Absolutely. Because it helped you get on the right course after the military. Absolutely. And and I don't want kids to ever think that there's only one way to get somewhere. There's nine different ways to get where you want to go. I never went to college in person one day. I did online college. I didn't do online college until I was 27, 28 years old. And now I have two master's degrees. It, 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 it doesn't, you don't always have to run that straight line to get where you're going. And that's not what God has for everybody. Mm -hmm. And so we always talk to our kids about, you know, you don't want to fall into peer pressure, but there's also a societal pressure to be like, hey, you graduate, you go to four years of college, you do this. No, well, that's not for everybody. Mm -hmm. Where do you feel like your faith made a turn in your life? I would say about seven years ago, I was working at a place called Camelot here in town in Bourbon A, and there was a worker there, and uh, her name was Jen. And she would not leave me alone. <laughs> she would not leave me alone. Every Friday, Ty, we want to see you in church. Ty, we want to see you in church. Ty, we want to see you. And I got to the point where I would duck her, and I would be like, ah, man, I hope, I, hope, I hope Jen Asher does not come around the corner. I hope she doesn't come around the corner because she's going to ask me to go to church. Aww. And at the time, I was not living okay, and I was not all right. And then one time, and this is besides my mom and my sister and my brother-in-law and my other sister saying, Ty, you got to get back in church. Ty, you got to get back in church. But to be honest with you, once one Friday, I was like, you know what? I'm tired of this. I'm just going to go. So she'll leave me alone <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and haven't missed a Sunday since. Oh, and then what has that done to like your relationship with Jesus? Just you, making that step. Well, it, it was one of those things to where I, I knew, I always knew that I was held, especially when I was overseas you know, there's five or six times that I, I should have probably died when I was overseas. And I knew I was held and I knew that God had something for me. I just refused to fall in line where I knew I should be. I just refused. And it, that, that sin nature kept saying, you know what, Ty, you can do whatever you want. You got till you got tomorrow. You got the next day. You got a week. You got a year. But you don't. And I'm glad that that turnaround happened sooner than later. So now it's been seven years since you've been on your recommitment of your faith journey yeah. and God has led you into speaking into the lives of young people. Yeah. And it's, and, 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 and I really genuinely love it. I mean, I went to, I went to seminary uh, six years ago and I finished seminary. And then I said to myself, you know what, let's see what else that we have. So I went back to seminary to another seminary to get my master's degree because I wanted to be able to on top of my original education, which is to help the kids, you know, get get schooling and everything, I want to be able to give them the correct answers 
on their on their path because kids these days it seems to me being a guidance counselor they're way more into money these days than they are into any sort of individual service and and it kind of scares me a little bit and i told him i was like listen I've made a lot of money in my life. I've had jobs where I've made lots of money. And I'm going to tell you, I'm way happier sitting in my office being Mr. Harris than I ever was being a fire captain making six figures because Mm. what I'm doing matters. And the kids, you know, they see it and they're like, okay, maybe we'll try to do some sort of service industry or maybe we'll try to help people and stuff like that. And that's all you can do. So you're really guiding these kids, not only in their career, but guiding them towards the kingdom like getting them to be kingdom minded instead of self minded and what's going to their life's going to look like for themselves. Yes, I want them to understand that, you know, having financial stability is amazing, but when we focus only on that, we're not accepting the fact that Jesus will provide. We're we're not accepting the fact if I go out there and say I can only get a job where I make six figures, whether it's helping somebody or not, it, it, you're just excluding the fact that 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 Christ will provide for you. And if you want to do something where you're just helping people, I mean, you're never going to be a millionaire in in the service industry. You're never going to be a millionaire. But guess what? You can go home every night and be like, you know what? I did what I could. I think of you as this walking speaker (laughs) because you constantly have Christian music playing through your phone in your pocket. So wherever you go, it's Mr. Harris is like this walking speaker of worship music. So tell me when when that started and why you do that. So right before I started at at Grace, I was like, you know what? I don't like I don't like empty space. I don't like empty noise. I you know, I actually have tonight is pretty bad for my military service. And I was like, what could I do to to, you know, to icebreaker this, that, and the other? And you know what? I keep my phone in my pocket, you know, with <laughs> with shine on. I keep my I keep my phone in my pocket. It plays all day. And the funniest thing about it was is I was gonna stop doing it because I thought it was a little bit disruptive but then I was in Bible class one day and I put the kids on self work and I saw them all mouthing the words while they were doing their work and I was like they do know the words they do know what this music is they 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 have been in church even though some of them haven't been for a very long time they know what this is and that's why I stuck with it because they identified with it as much as I did and it seemed to almost calm down mm-hmm. everybody they're like mm-hmm. oh and they all know the words to these songs mm-hmm. it's like the truth singing over your classroom yep <laughs> If there was one thing you could tell a teenager that might be listening right now, what is the one thing you would want them to take from today? I guess if you have a heart to help people, don't ever think about what it's going to do for you or how you're going to make it or how you're going to survive. And I know it sounds a little irresponsible for me to say that, but I, you know, I have a, I have a friend of mine that takes Bibles to places where you can't have Bibles. You know, this guy was making probably about $250,000 a year as a businessman. And one day he was like, I'm not doing anything worth anything. And he just woke up one day and invested his money into Bibles. And now he backpacks his Bibles to places where they can't have them. And it's kind of a scary job, but it's the happiest I've ever seen him in my entire life. He's a super happy guy, you know, because he knows that he's making an effort for the kingdom and he's making an effort to to give things to people that could never ever have it before and he makes nothing you know he makes absolutely nothing he's the happiest person i know he lives in a little tiny home in the backyard of a pastor's house who gave it to him and super happy guy just don't run after the money it's it's not what you think what about a, a young man that's at the beginning of his faith journey um just made the decision you know maybe to go into the military and serve his country what advice would you have for that military person? I would say that you shouldn't bend as far as say say like I did. I I bent I bent to the point where I broke and I forgot who I was. There's no problem with not necessarily standing in a room and and preaching and pointing at people all the time, but we're supposed to live, we're supposed to be lights, we're supposed to be examples and I'm telling you if you give that appropriate example People will come to you and ask you why the way why you are the way you are. They will. And you'll be like, hey, I'm a Christian. I believe in Christ. And following Christ is the reason I am the way that I am. And they'll be like, you know what? That looks like an amazing life. Can I try it? And then you can start with the gospel and, and every that. And you never underestimate the seeds that you plant. Never underestimate it. You could talk to somebody for three years and they could be like, get out of my face. I hate you. I hate you. Ten years from now, they could walk into a church and be like, you know what? I remember that seed that so-and-so planted in me, and this is what we're going to do. We're going to keep going with it. So what is the biggest lesson so far that you feel like you have learned in your life? I guess the biggest thing that I've learned is 
once God determines that you're his, there's no there's no running from it. There's no there's no escape from that. There's no I, I don't even I don't want to use the word reprieve because it seems like a bad thing, but there is no you you you're his and he's determined that and that's what is. And so the best thing you can do is read your Bible, pray every day, give the gospel, go to church, love God, and just acquiesce because that's the it, 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 your life will be so much more amazing than if you fight it. You just completely surrender. Yep, you completely surrender. After the service, you then went into contract work. Yeah. for overseas. Mm-hmm. So how was that experience for you? Um, I mean, it was, it, I was in a lot, of, a lot of tough places and, you know, that's your faith gets tested a whole lot. And I, I think my biggest, the biggest aha moment I ever had, I think with God, it was 2006. I was in, I was in a bunker and uh, we were getting mortared, mortared for two days straight. I mean, two days straight, slept in it, ate in it, lived in the bunker and I remember I called my mom on these little bitty phones that they give us, these little arachnophones. phones. They're terrible. They have a 10-second delay on them. And I called her up and I told her, I was like, hey, you know, I'm, I'm not coming home. I was like, please take care of my kids. I was mm-hmm. like, I'm not making it. And she's like, you know, hey, this, that, and the other. And it cut off. And I remember saying to myself, I remember praying, and I can't remember if I said it out loud or not, but I think I said something like, you know, Father, please, like as loud as I could, no mortars. They stopped, and there wasn't another one the rest of the time I was there. Your aha moment. Yep. You you prayed, and he answered it in that moment. Yeah. yeah. And you knew in that moment that you were going to come back home and live for him the rest of your life. For sure. <laughs> yeah. It's there. There. You know that people can pass off stuff all the time. You know you can you can say oh that was just fate or whatever people like to label the workings of God as, but in that moment there was nothing else it could be. Yeah. There's nothing, there's absolutely nothing else it could be. And I was like, I'm good. I got it. I learned my lesson. Here we go. You got my attention, God. Yep. <laughs> yeah. so it's such a beautiful thing when he makes it so real to you. Because mm-hmm. at that moment, you knew the truth from all of your childhood. Yeah. And then you were in that moment where you're facing death. And then you cried out to him. And yeah. he answered you in such a personal way. Yeah. And people are like... And then when people ask me, they're like, well, well, how can you how can you have faith like this? I'm like, I, I think it's easy. I think it's really easy to have faith in God. I don't. In fact, I don't understand how people don't. You know, I don't know how people make it through this world and this life without God. I don't understand it. Like I wouldn't have I wouldn't have made it to 43 years old. I, I don't know how anybody walks around with with nothing holding them. And, and they're just like, oh, OK, you know, it's. I thank God every day for the for the seeds that were planted in me and for the good things and the quote unquote bad things because I'm okay with where I am right now. But would you agree that you had to walk through those fires to be able to have the faith that you have now today? Absolutely. And I and I'm super I, I, I've never been more thankful. Even when I got hurt overseas, I'm super thankful for it. You know, and it's still a problem now. But I don't I don't regret it. I don't regret anything that I've done because without that, I wouldn't be where I am now. This was Shine 180, Ty's story. Stories of forgiveness, redemption, and restoration. I'm Steph Reynolds, Director of Partner Care here at Shine.fm. Your story offers hope and encouragement to others. Share your story today by calling 855-987-9866. That's 855-987-9866. Shine 180. Stories of lives transformed by Jesus because of your faithfulness.